Today's New Testament reading is the first epistle to the Corinthians, the eighth chapter. Now, concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there are may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged, if his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. This is the word of the Lord. For today's meditation on God's word, we welcome Pastor Charles St. Ange. Sir Francis Bacon, almost 500 years ago, wrote that knowledge itself is power. And that certainly seems to be true, even in our world. Nations, corporations, even individuals keep knowledge secret in order to keep the power that comes from that knowledge. If everybody knew the 11 herbs and spices in the Kentucky Fried Chicken recipe, where would KFC be today? The formula for Coca-Cola is still kept under lock and key. And the United States has so many intelligence services that they are often referred to as the intelligence community. Philosopher John Ralston Soule estimates that the United States alone creates over 50 million state secrets every year, and he's argued that the age of reason has turned out to be the age of structure. In his words, a time when, in the absence of purpose, the drive for power as a value in itself has become the principal indicator of social approval, and the winning of power has become the measure of social merit. In short, To know something is to have power, and to have power is to be somebody in our world. The Apostle Paul makes much the same point in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, but he puts it a little bit differently than Sir Francis Bacon or John Ralston Soule. He writes simply that knowledge puffs up. Knowledge causes pride, and self-pride in the eyes of God is not power, but weakness. What matters is not what we know, but whether God knows us. And to be known by God is to love. Knowledge is as often used to destroy as it is to create, but love, acting sacrificially for someone else, for the other, always builds up. Paul is dealing with many problems in Corinth. In chapter 8, he tackles the problem of eating meat sacrificed to idols. In a knowledge-based world, Paul could simply say, I'm the apostle. I say it's okay to eat the meat, and here's why. Or he could say, as your teacher, I say it's wrong, so don't do it. But Paul knows the deeper problem is the quest for knowledge and power. Some in Corinth have convinced themselves that it's okay or not okay to eat the meat, and they're using that knowledge to build themselves up at the expense of other people. So Paul backs up and says, what does living like a Christian look like? What it looks like, Paul writes, 
is Jesus Christ dying for you, and you, and you, and for me, dying on a cross to make us one body by his blood. Therefore, Paul says, work to build that body that Christ died for to create up into him. We know that Paul has his own opinion about idle meats. Food will not commend us to God, he writes. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But that's not what really matters. What matters is that we act in such a way as Christians, as those redeemed by the blood of Christ, as the church, that we all find ourselves together growing closer to the God who knows us through Jesus. I've served as a missionary in countries where the Christian community has become convinced that drinking is not appropriate. Let's suppose I think it's okay to have a beer or a glass of wine. I may be convinced that not drinking seems to conflict with Jesus' own attitude towards alcohol. But my first concern for the Christians around me is to display to them the same love Christ has shown to me. That may mean drinking only at home. It may mean not drinking at all. It may mean teaching when the opportunity arises and also listening to the concerns of the community. But the desire is to build up the community of Christ, not show off how much more knowledgeable I am. Of course, we have to be careful not to turn all of this into knowledge either. Knowing that we need to love can be used to lord it over others who we think are not acting out of love. When we're tempted to think that way, in those moments, we ought to think of Christ's silence during his trials and crucifixion. He didn't say much. He acted. And he acted out of love for you and me that we might be saved, that our sins might be forgiven. Christ died for all of us. His actions were his words. We, his forgiven servants, are called to love each other in the same way that Christ has loved us.